Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, nice to see so many people have, have joined the session today. So a great big welcome to everybody. Nice to see some people who have joined us before in these webinars and some people who are new to the sessions. So again, a great big welcome. I'm Christine Johnston. I'm the Engagement Programmes Manager for Healthcare Improvement Scotland. And today's webinar is entitled Empowering Rural Communities, Unleashing the Potential of Co-Production. And we really do have a terrific example of co-production to share with everybody today. To help with the sound and picture quality during the webinar, we've taken the absolute liberty of switching off your camera and set your microphone to mute. So that will help with, with the quality of the, um, not only the webinar, but the, the recording itself. And this month, just to flag up to you that we, we are following a slightly different format in so much as we'll be hearing from six, six speakers in a panel discussion format. So this is, this is a bit new for us. So a little bit of a test of change. Timing is crucial and our speakers have so much information to share, but we will keep to time and Ali will make sure of that and I'll introduce Ali a little bit later. Um, but hoping to hear from speakers around seven minutes each. The challenge with that is that we'll probably have quite a few questions in the chat box that we might not get around to, but I promise we'll scoop these up at the end and we'll provide answers to everybody who has posed a question in the chat box that we might not get around to answering at the end of the discussion session. Our speakers have offered their email addresses very kindly, so any additional information that's required after the session, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with any of our speakers. And we'll be sharing a recording of the session on our website where you can also find details of uh, future programmes of webinars. And so to kick off, I'm going to introduce you to my colleague Ali McCrossan. Ali is an engagement officer for Healthcare Improvement Scotland and covers the Argyll and Butte area. What Ali doesn't know about public engagement isn't worth knowing, frankly. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Ali to take us into the, dis into the discussion this afternoon. And please sit back and enjoy what you're about to hear. Ali? Thanks, Hi Ali, thanks very much. There, Thank you. On. No worries. Thank you. Thank you for my introduction. Um, if I can just give people um, a short uh, setting the scene um, of Argyll and Butte, and that may help prepare you for all the information that's going to flood in uh, to your screens. Um, for the use for any of you who don't know Argyll and Butte, um, it's. Uh, very large, remote uh, and really quite rural um, geographical local authority and health and social care partnership. Um, it's very unique, um, but as you can imagine, that poses some challenges. Um, previously, there's been pockets of co-production in Argyll and Butte, um, but not a concentrated effort until this point. Um, Today is an opportunity for the panel to talk out loud about the work um, that they've been involved with and in true co-production style, um, the panel would like to see this as a reciprocal learning opportunity, um, an exchange of information um, and the gift that they um, want to do is share um, with everyone in the webinar today the journey that they've taken to date, but what they'd also like to do is um, learn from the questions that you'll pose at the end of the webinar today that will help them in terms of their thought process. Um, so just before we go into introducing um, the panel members, um, if I could ask Linda, can you um, post Frank's poll for us, please? Can I ask um, everyone just to take a few seconds to um, complete this poll um, and we'll also pose this at the end of the webinar as well. Thank you.
thank you. Um, Frank, were you going to just give a sort of short feedback to that or were we actually just going to go straight into introducing you and your colleagues? I'll just very briefly mention that I think uh, the numbers that we're likely to see would probably reflect what most people experience right across Scotland, which is we are neither here nor there when it comes to, to the word. And I'm hoping by the end of today, when we take this poll again, there'll be more on the, the side of we understand what it means and what, how it applies, particularly within our island Butte. OK, that's great. Thank you, Frank. Linda, can I ask that we we have our panel members um, on the screen and then I'll be able to introduce them for everyone. I think we are still waiting on another two. I think there's a technical issue. If you just start without, I'll just add. OK, that's fine. So um, our panel today um, consists of Frank Riley, um, who has already um, been on screen. Um, Frank's done um, a lot of work around supporting this going forward in uh, methodology and co-production um, and also a, a national and international um, experience um, of co-production so has been invaluable to this um, piece of work. Alison McGrory, um, so Alison tell me tell me your title so that I get it absolutely spot on. <laughs> I'm the Associate Director of Public Health in Argyll and Butte Health and Social Care Partnership and employed by NHS Highland. Thank you very much. I think I would have got there, but I think you put it much um, better than me. I am, again, Alison in her role is, um, is fundamental, as all the panel members are, to the work um, that's going on in Argyll and Butte um, and uh, is keen to um, yeah, carry on that co-produced um, process. Uh, Linda Curry, um, lead AHP... <laughs> for our Island Butte Health and Social Care Partnership. Um, I'm sure there's much more to that. Linda, would you like to elaborate for me? Yeah, uh, thank you, Alison. I'm the um, lead allied health professional for um, our Island Butte HSCP, like Alison. I work for NHS Ireland and Alison and I co-lead the uh, HSCP um, element of the uh, living well and prevention work that we're doing currently with our colleagues. That's great. Thank you, Linda. Um, as I say, all really um, key roles um, within this co-production process in our Gail and Butte. Nikki, could I ask you to give your role in terms of Macmillan, please? See, I get the Jaffa Cake fine for being the first person to speak with my mic still switched off. Apologies <laughs> for that. Um, my name is Nicola Harrison. I'm the Macmillan Partnership Manager covering the West and Central Scotland for Macmillan. Thank you, Nikki. Taki Suleiman, Chief Executive for Argyll and Butte Third Sector Interface. Taki, would you like to add to that introduction? Yeah, no one knows what a third sector interface is. In, in effect, we are um, the advocacy um, organisation for third sector groups in, in Argyll and Butte. And on behalf of the TSI and the groups that we represent, um, I've been participating in the Prevention and Living World Boards uh, for the last couple of years. That's great. Thank you, Taki. Now, Mahalia Scott isn't actually on our screen. Um, Again, um, Mihaila is a um, development worker with Macmillan um, and she's now on screen. So I, I'm going to ask Mihaila just to give a wee bit um, more information in terms of her role. Thanks, Ali. I was wondering where I was for a while there. Um, some magic fairy must have turned me back on. <laughs> so, yeah, I am uh, currently working between Macmillan um, and the HSCP and Live Argyle, um, program managing a uh, the development of a living well program of which co-production has become quite a big part of, of the work stream. Excellent, thank you, Mihaila. Can I just go into um, our questions, um, if that's okay with the panel members? The first question um, is to Alison. 
And Alison, would you be able to give us the historical context of the work that has been done in Argyll and Butte and that has led to this deep dive into exploring co-production? And I will be keeping yeah. track of time. Oh, <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah, I've actually put this on a slide and I hope this is not, uh, maybe it's a bit of a reality check in terms of my timeline goes back to 2010 when I moved back to Argyll. So I was born and brought up in Campbelltown, that's my hometown. And then 13 years ago, I found my way back here like a lot of local Argyll folk do. Um, so I've been working in Argyll and Butte for those 13 years. So I, I kind of went back in terms of preparing for that question, both in terms of my own personal learning and um, I suppose some of those wider contextual factors. Is that okay on the screen there, Ali? Oh gosh, my screen has now gone blank. We've got a blank screen at oh, this time. Is that oh, it? There, there we go. There, there we go. It's here. fine. I think I just because it's one slide. I think I clicked too many times. Okay, so um, yes, I spent the 10 years before moving back to Campbelltown working in um, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, and it was in quite a corporate role. Um, but at the time, there was a lot of kind of history in terms of some of you may remember the social inclusion partnerships, and there was huge money in the system there in, in terms of building capacity. Um, and it was a really nice time to work in health improvement. And I Although I was in a corporate role working with employers, I worked alongside those teams. So in my naivety, I arrived in Argyll and Butte actually thinking I knew a fair bit about community development. And we didn't necessarily use the term co-production in those days, but you know we talked about community development and building capacity. And actually, yeah, it was a huge amount of naivety because I really didn't know a lot, particularly in our rural communities where you might look at one town that's got lots of services, um, community led or community developed um, and then you look at another neighbouring town and there's nothing the same um, so you can't just as we as I personally learned to my detriment you can't parachute something from one place to another without that that sort of community involvement and community activism behind it um, and one of the, the key things in my learning was this a program we called Appleseed, our Gail and Butte Local Services Initiative. And this was a partnership action research project funded by Carnegie UK. And it was about looking at existing good practices of social enterprise and what were the ingredients in terms of making those successful and what was the learning for statutory services. So I recently, uh, for a number of reasons, including today, I've been looking back at uh, that learning and sadly, a lot of that learning, you know, I could have written some of those reports last week and it would still be very relevant in terms of the, the key things that we're talking about now. Um, and, and maybe that is a bit of a, a, a sort of um, reality check in terms of what we're trying to do with co-production. It's within the existing paradigm that we're all working in, which is about um, looking at describing the problem, identifying the deficits, thinking about the solution, which is evidence-based to solve those deficits. And my heart takes me to that um, assets-based community development that I know many of you will be familiar with. Um, but I'll not say more about that. We might have a, an opportunity to come back, but there was a lot of learning through Appleseed and that then informed some of my practice uh, moving on through that decade, particularly with some of the funding streams that were national. So reshaping care for older people was a huge investment in Scotland and then subsequently the Integrated Care Fund. And both of those programmes were about using investment to make a change and they had themes of prevention running through them um, and also that, that sort of um, building capacity within the third sector. And when I think back 10 years to the beginning of uh, reshaping care for older people, there wasn't that clear partnership linkage between community-based services and statutory services. And indeed, you know, there was often a bit of suspicion in terms of who are these people that we're referring our patients to and all of the governance issues. And, you know, you never hear that nowadays. It's just so normal for us to work statutory sector and uh, third sector hand in hand and um, have that, that crossover in terms of how we support people. Um, but I think we embraced that reshaping care for older people um, and I don't think necessarily that was the case, case throughout Scotland. So we put lots of investment into local services and a lot of learning, which again helped us with the integration care fund. And 
that money was mainstreamed and we were just hearing this morning in one of our locality planning groups that one of our projects in Helensborough still to this day gets a bit, I mean, it's not a huge amount of money, but they still get some of that ongoing uh, funding, which is a legacy of the Integrated Care Fund. And I think, you know, that's really to be celebrated because we're in a climate of significantly reducing budgets and significantly increasing demands. So, um, and we are a, a health and social care partnership that's funded to deal with the problems in the here and the now. And as a public health person, my um, key thing that gets me out of bed in the morning is about how we can prevent problems and improve um, health and wellbeing across the population, but we don't necessarily get funded to do that. So it's always that balance in terms of the people who need Apologies, services now Alison. and the people who might in the future. So sorry, a minute, I'm a minute over before, time. No, no, a minute and at one minute. Bit, okay, um, I'll maybe yeah. say one or two more things then. Back in 2016, we had a conference in Araher uh, and it was badged co-production. Uh, you know, and sometimes I think, what have we achieved since then? But actually, I think we have, because we now all really understand what co-production is. Maybe we're not putting it into practice day to day, but, you know, there's a lot of um, the same people. People generally stay with us in our Gail and Butte. Um, so there's a lot of those same people. Um, the Living Well strategy might get a chance to come back to that. We wrote that in 2019 and I wonder sometimes if we had a crystal ball because that saw us right through the pandemic. That's about how we support people uh, to have better outcomes, um, prevent problems, particularly supporting people around about long-term health conditions. Um, and we've refocused uh, that and Linda and I work really closely on that. And of course, all of the principles of co-production that we used throughout the COVID pandemic that we all lived through, particularly uh, my responsibilities around about caring for people. And we had to, to use principles of co-production and devolve power and money out into local communities and let go of the reins. So lots of successes there. So hopefully that's me within time and happy Thanks. to come back to anything. Uh, later. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Alison. Can I just briefly take any comments from any other panel members? Um, just to be aware, we are we've, we need to be quite tight on time. So, any other thoughts? That's great. Okay. Um, can I move on to our next question, um, which is posed to Frank? Um, Frank, would you be able to give us a working definition of co-production? Thank you. I'll give. I'll give you give it a chance anyway. Um, can everybody see that slide? Yes, right, fabulous. Right, so it, it just leads directly on from what Alison was speaking about earlier on. 2016, there was a little book published, might even been earlier than that, by the Scottish Government, which talked about co-production as a mechanism for engaging and involving people. Uh, but it was within the context of rapidly reducing uh, finances in local government and in health. Um, so just hold on to that, because I'm sure that has influenced uh, other perceptions of co-production because the definition I'm going to give you now is based on uh, historical European and uh, US evidence, um, which doesn't necessarily take that uh, uh, There we go. So it's quite simple, actually. It's a process of collaboration which connects the needs of a community to a means of meeting them. Now, that's very global, and underneath all of that are lots of little intricacies, particularly around what that those needs might well be and what's common around all of that. So going back historically, um, the word itself actually came from a political economist called Eleanor Ostrom way back in the late 60s. Um, and what she was describing was how people came together to protect something that was important to them or how they sustained something that was very important to them. So the direct link with what Alison was talking about earlier on about community development and about capacity building. Sometimes we get lost in the word co-production, what does it mean? But actually, literally, it is about community capacity building and sharing of power. All the sorts of things that we've done in the past are being done now. So don't get lost in the definition. It's what, what's done is much more important than the definition itself. So what are the commons? Well, there's a, a paper that was done uh, again back in the, the 60s and other places, which was talking about the overuse of commons. So these are the things that we have between us all, and the classical example examples actually of um, uh, grazing rights. But this one relates to, to water. So if everybody has access to a limited resource and there's no limits on it, then it was very quickly be exhausted. And the tragedy of the commons is that inevitably, if there are no controls, that's exactly what happens. Now, Ellen Ostrom said, no, that's not what happens. Because in other societies, particularly in, in Europe, 
there are rules that are put in place by the local community in order to manage that resource. Now, what I'm asking people to think about now, actually, is what is the commons we're talking about here? It's health and well-being. It's uh, being healthy for the future and bringing people on board with that commons. Um, and that's not dissimilar to, this is uh, supposedly the Olympic Games. So the, the Greek nations fought one with one another most of the time. But one of the things that they did have in common was coming together at least once every four years for this particular event where they laid down arms. And that was a commons they decided was worth protecting. It also reduced some elements of conflict. It was the same with the, the Oracle of Delphi. This is getting a bit too uh, historical, so I'll move quickly on. So Brian, can I just say it? one minute? One minute, Brian. Well, the, the other <laughs> bit that's really important to remember about all of this is the perception of what the commons is will vary from one person to the other. Hence this picture of the, the elephant and the people with blindfolds on. And that's a crucial bit that actually all of us need to draw together when it comes to co-production. It's very challenging, but the crucial bit is the gifts that we give one another in order to get to this space where they understand where we're going. Um, and the other bit, and this is probably the most important part about the process, this is uh, this is a multi-term game that we're talking about here. Essentially, what we don't want to happen are people in power or people in our communities um, coming in for a one-shot game. The one-shot game is this uh, uh, element of the, the diagram here, where you take action, you get the payoff, and that's it done. What we are beginning to work within, within uh, Argyle and Butte is this reciprocal game that goes on for a bit of time. And we're hoping over time for co-production to develop this belief in the action that makes change happen, that can control external factors, that is developing future strategies. This is iterative. It takes time, effort. It's not something that's ever done. The key phrase I would leave you with around co-production is that fight is never won. You have to keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. Just as a collaboration, capacity building, and community development was a thing in the past and is a thing now, it's still the same flights that we're doing just now. So that's a very simplistic uh, roundup of co-production. Thank you very much, Frank. And apologies to everyone for the timing of coming in and telling you you've got a minute left. But um, again, thank you, Frank. Um, can I ask um, the next speaker, um, Linda um, Curry? Linda, can you speak about how adjusting to this has been for you um, coming from within the NHS um, and the Health and Social Care Partnership in Argyll and Butte? And I'll keep you to time. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, Ali. I'll try and do my best. Um, yeah, so so I think um, as, a, as a member of Argyll and Butte HSCP, we've, you, you know, our, our sort of strategic plan has really has been about trying to improve the collaboration and co-production for many years really and um, we've been involved in that work both pre and post integration not to say we are experts in getting it right but we are endeavoring um, but I think um, it you know it, it, it came about really for me um, in my role I, I was 12 years ago I was um, a, a lead OT in our gallery at HSCP when we started on the reshaping care for older people journey and, I, and if it's okay to just uh, reflect that at the time when, when, when I could see that it was a real multi-agency program that was starting in our garden view, I, I just remember thinking, gosh, what, you know, why are we looking out with what well, we've got so much work to do within? Why, why are we doing that? You know, um, but obviously the people that were leading that program for us at the time saw that saw a much bigger picture than I did. And I would say that perhaps many clinical you know when you're working frontline clinically you can be very head down and, and seeing just you know the work in front of you like so so the last 12 years have, have really been you know opened my eyes if you like and we've we've continued over those years to I think build really good and solid relationships with with lots of different partners um I've been lucky enough to work with uh, a number of unpaid carer services and other services like the unhealthy options in Oban um, you know being aware of and working very closely with many of our third sector colleagues across the patch and whenever we meet in in various you know events and engagement events you know and we see the work that's happening I'm always staggered at how hard people are working and, and the amazing job they're doing so I, I would just say that respect has built up over the years um, I can see that the services that are provided are you know, person-centred, they're, they're much more flight of foot than perhaps we are in, in those bigger organisations. Um, 
able to be flexible and, and sort of flex around the need in the community and the, and the person's need at the time, which I think we struggle to do sometimes. And I, I do basically believe that people, you know, for people to, to, to navigate to the statutory service, to, to health and social work, for example, when they don't really need it is, is not is not is not the ideal route for them. I think we've got certain things in our toolbox um, and we, we would always be pulling people further into statutory services, whereas when they're being looked after in, in the community um, by all of those partners around it, you know, it's a much better, much more person centred experience. So um, apologies, Linda, that's one minute. One minute. <laughs> yeah. And I think also a feeling of um, and the dog will start by right at the worst moment. Um, I think we don't always need health and social work professionals. I think, uh, and we're seeing that with our prevention programme, the work that can go on in community with colleagues, it, you know, can be, is much more um, skilled and person-centred and, and flexible, if you like, than, than we can offer. Um, our Living Well programme has developed over a couple of years, really um, coming out of that um, uh, COVID first lockdown, where a few of us as partners were really we, let's get together about this and we really think about how people have become deconditioned but um, I think just to finish uh, I, I think it's about a feeling of confidence and respect and being able to kind of let go and not having to know what the what the outcome is going to be in a couple of years um, just being open and having that honest open relationship but just being able to sit you know take your time and not have to sort of be in control if you like and just let things happen uh, and even if you do them and they're wrong, and that's our approaches over the next few years, we know we'll put things in place and they might not be right, but that's OK, because we'll learn from that and we'll, you know, we'll be engaging and we'll get there in the end with a better service. That's me. Thanks. Thank you, Linda. Um, can I now go, move on to um, Nikki? Um, partnership work has been a big part of this work. Would you be able to tell us more about that? Thank you. Sure. Hello again, everyone. Uh, so while I was preparing for this afternoon, um, I can give you the dictionary definition of partnerships, which is a cooperative relationship between people or groups who agree to share responsibility for achieving some specific goal. We've uh, been on a bit of a journey, haven't we? In fact, we're still on the journey. Um, and I would say we're probably at the airport with tickets in hand just now. About three years ago, uh, a previously uh, funded Macmillan project was reaching the end of its pilot. And at that stage, we had no opportunity for sustained funding. So we started a conversation. The conversation began with, what does good look like? And I was concerned that whilst Macmillan had grant funding available to further develop our local services with you, I didn't want to be in the same position in three years time that there was no opportunity to sustain our new offer. So I decided um, it was time to be brave. And you'll hear that a lot from this group and stop doing what we always do and start asking more questions. So what does good look like became my mantra. Coupled with the not very strategic, and Mahalia will remember this, we know we need to do a thing, we just don't know what that thing is. And so we stopped. We stopped doing what we always do, and we started asking those questions and started thinking a little bit more about, um, Oh, sorry, we stopped doing what Macmillan always did, which was suggesting what services you should have in your community. And we started asking that question. It was around about this time we introduced a crucial player into the partnership in the form of my colleague Tara Anderson, who is Macmillan's engagement lead for Scotland. And Tara immediately said, you're asking the wrong question. Um, don't ask what does good look like? Ask what matters to you? Um, if you ask people what matters to you, an individual or a family member will give you a much more rounded view because you're 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 asking the right question. And it was around about this time that Linda came in with a very generous offer to match fund some project work. And I could easily spend another hour going through um, the next three years with the COVID pauses and the forums that we've done. But that's not what today is about. 
what I want to share with you is the power of partnerships and being brave enough to say we don't know what you want. Acknowledging from a Macmillan perspective that despite being a high profile cancer charity, we absolutely do not know it all. And the vital links with all of the people speaking today, the project board, the local contributors are the people that know and they are the people that make this partnership. And it truly is a partnership. It's with its patients, their loved ones, the nurses, the doctors, the culture and leisure leads, the fitness providers, other charities and our health improvement team. And most importantly, the local people, because they're the ones that know. So myself at Macmillan, I'm just a very small part of the story. But what I hope we can bring is that added value through the gift of time and the gift of grant funding and the ability to say stop and be brave. And let's go back to that drawing board. So for me, when we're talking about partnerships, what we're really talking about is relationships and the power of them. And by building relationships with both local people and decision makers, we can be stronger together and we can work together to uh, achieve that shared ambition. What I hope we can do is avoid duplication and make the best use of our resources. We can recognise when we get things wrong and we can work together to make it right. We can look at our Nikki, community. Sorry, can I just one minute? We're, thank you. Nearly there. <laughs> nearly there. Thank you. We can look at our community assets and say, hey, look, you're brilliant at doing this. Taki, you and your team, you're, you're going to be the experts. Can you lead on this aspect of the service? So I guess I could um, add in some final cliche about um, the whole being greater, uh, but I won't. I will leave you with our one recurring mantra of be brave and don't just do more of the same. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. That was great. And just by um, process now, it's Taki. Um, Taki, can I present your question for you? Um, relationship building is such an important part of co-production. Taki, can you elaborate on why it is fundamental in terms of people in communities living their best lives, particularly in remote and rural areas such as Argyllan Butte? Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Ali. That, that is an absolutely crucial dimension to this. Um, Co-production will, by definition, look different in, in each area. Um, but because of the rurality of Argyll and Butte, as, as Ali, you touched on uh, right at the beginning of, of the meeting, um, Argyll and Butte is, you know, a massive geographical area. It's you know, over 7,000 square kilometres, it's 9% of Scotland, but there's only 86,000 people there. Um, and that does have an impact on the shape of services. You, you cannot have economies of scale. Um, and it makes the challenge of delivering relevant services even harder and, and quite expensive. Um, so it means that we've got to work harder. Uh, we've got to work hard at co-production. We've got to work hard at, at community engagement and community empowerment. Travel in Argyle and Butte is 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 very very difficult it's expensive it's infrequent it's unreliable um and in argyle you can imagine with 86,000 people people have multiple roles not only within their own families and their own households and their own communities but at work uh, in their volunteering roles so getting the time uh, to take part in co-production is a challenge which is why co-production as a process uh, needs to be given time uh, because there's a number of key elements that we found um, that have been really really helpful um, and the first is around that relationship building that Nikki was talking about and others have talked about it's a really crucial investment and it may seem really really obvious to say that um, and it's worth just reflecting on the perception of communities about about services um, about uh, the state of our nation in general which is that there is a lack of trust in powerful institutions. Um, we speak different languages, um, professional languages, um, we have different priorities, and so it's really, really important that we take that time uh, to engage. Um, and communities have heard it all before, so it's important that we take that time um, to, to build trust. Um, and so, you know, initially, of course, when communities come together, um, there's that 
sense of blame. Who's to blame? Who can I blame for my, my poor quality service? Who can I blame for my situation? And I think that has caused in the past um, a sort of a reaction from, from all of us in positions of power, uh, which you can withdraw from that engagement, which makes co-production even more important. It allows you to have a direct conversation. And just as I, a, a little aside, it, it's just just worth reflecting on that complexity of the relationship map because co-production can happen at a strategic level as Alison was talking about in the production of the joint strategic plan it happens at a service design level it happens at an organizational level and obviously it happens at that individual service user level so you've got to think about each of those levels um, and all of those different voices because sometimes of course individuals will need those advocacy organizations to have their say um, and I have to say uh, you know sort of all credit to all the partners around the table they have invested heavily not just financially but in time um, to, to give space to co-production to work um, as Nikki said it is the start of our journey um, <laughs> start of our journey. That's, that's not true as, as Alice has talked about the journey started a long time ago we're still ongoing and it, ne it will never finish but it, of course it will get better it will get deeper um, and that's why we're collectively we're investing in uh, a training the trainers uh, process my staff members public health staff members so that we can you know understand what it is to um, to give up our power um, as individuals who play our role Role, to share power with with our communities and listen um, to their voices right at the beginning um, of the decision making process and that's absolutely absolutely critical um, the other aspect for me is really around um, understanding each other's expertise sorry Taki, just one minute one minute okay. thank you um, I, I, that's my last point really which is about giving each other time to listen to different voices in in the room um, and that's a, an essential aspect valuing everybody's contribution whether you be a, a professional with 30 years experience or someone using um, services for the first time that's great thank you very much Taki. Hayley can I come on to you um, your question is what are the next steps in terms of co-production in Argyll and Butte and I'll keep you to time thank you Thanks, Sally. Yeah, I think I almost need to go back a little step um, and just because it's been really interesting hearing everyone's answers and listening to Alison, sort of seeing how long this conversation has been going on for when really I've only just kind of come in and, um, in the last few years or so. And so I think just sort of going back a little bit into the more recent history, it became apparent when we started working in partnership um, with Macmillan and the HSCP and Live Argyle and the TSI, we were all coming together in what was then termed the Prevention Board, which is now the Living Well Board. And we were talking about co-production and, you know, it's in all of the strategies and, and it turned out everybody in the room had a kind of slightly different idea of what that was, let alone how we do it. And so I think it became really apparent that like, aha, maybe now is a moment that we need to really do another deep dive into this. And I guess Maybe this is just showing that that's going to be a cycle that we need to continue. Keep asking, what is this thing and how do we do it? You know, so. Um, so, yeah, in the spring, we then we reached out to Frank um, and had a, a, a couple of training days, um, which were really, really useful. And then since then, we've had um, an offer which the TSI organized, which has been great, where um, the organizations that were present and the and the people that were present at the um, co-production training day are then able to um, get free consultation from Frank um, in the meantime and then we're coming back again in September to discuss how how it's been as a process and how we've all um, been able to utilize the learning from that first session and and work on any questions that that come up and then as Taki said we're also um, having a train the trainer day in September um, where we'll have public health staff and TSI staff um, taking things further also the well-being program that we're working on together in partnership we're really hoping to really do quite a lot of co-production um, in each locality with that and, and sort of use that almost as a as um, 
a test and, and using the different localities we're so lucky in our geography it's all so different that we get to try different things in different areas and and see what works um, and so I guess next is really to keep the conversation going and to keep building momentum um, and just as everyone else has said it's just reiterating the same thing that this is an emergent process and all good development work should be an emergent process you know you, you shouldn't feel comfortable that you know what's next um, so it does require bravery um, and yeah it's just about uh, keeping going with that process. I was Thank maybe even very... under time. No, that was <laughs> perfectly timed. Thank you very much. OK, the, we're um, moving to um, the stage where this is for all panel members um, and we'd like to take the opportunity to thank you for your time. Um, it's been really, really constructive and formative, um, particularly from a remote and rural context of living and working in Argyll and Butte when thinking about co-production. So if I can just come on to the last um, question. Um, would each of you be able to succinctly state what are your best hopes for what might be achieved through co-production in Argyll and Butte? Um, and I know it's quite difficult, um, but can we just be quite succinct as we're going through this bit, please? Uh, Mahalia? Yeah, thanks. I think for me, the most important thing that I would hope for is the culture change within the bigger organizations so that um, we can start working with the unknown more and create an environment and a culture in which it's safe um, to to step into that unknown space and accept the messiness of co-production um, so that we can start working towards having power with our communities um, much more. Thank you, Mahalia. Alison? Yeah, I was just jotting down some notes furiously there. Oh, I'm really, really thoughtful about this one. And I, I said a wee bit um, when I was talking about assets based community development. And I think it's really, really tricky because we're in this deficits paradigm. I, I explained that. Um, and I think it's within all of our responsibility in terms of the conversations we have, both inwardly in terms of the people that we're working with and outwardly in terms of community members, friends, uh, if we're doing engagement events, I suppose in terms of that wider society. So we talk about the social determinants of health um, and people's health is affected much more by those social determinants than by whether they've got a hospital on their doorstep. So it's about the economy, it's about community wealth building. Taki and I are having those conversations, um, really vibrant work around about that. So I think that wider context of the Scotland that we live in and I suppose the, the laws of the land, um, and I think that's within all of our gift as citizens to really be quite thoughtful round about that. And again, that doesn't happen overnight, but you know, I think citizen power goes to the heart of co-production and Taki's point about relationships is so, so important as well. So maybe something in that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alison. Linda? Yeah, um, I acknowledging that we, we're at the start of a journey. We're at the uh, we're at the airport. I like that, Nikki. That's good. Um, but I hope we continue uh, in in the culture that we are developing, really around trust and mutual respect, and that we do continue to legitimately co-produce as we actually start to put our plans. You know, we start to imp implement the plans and. and start services and, and work in localities that we do actually um, continue to, to review and engage and co-produce on that as, as, we're, as we're working on it um, and as the services start and, and I think really just stay open to change and to, to whatever comes really we're on we're on a journey. Thanks Linda. Taki? Yeah, just picking up on some points, really, I think I think the crucial one, if we get this right, it's an increase in legitimacy in our public institutions. And the crucial one is public. I think at the moment the public don't feel um, they have a huge say in how services are designed, um, how choices are made um, and how resources are rationed. And I think these are really, really difficult um, concepts um, and not everybody 
wants to get involved in those, uh, but some people do. Um, and I think the next one really is around an increase in individual and community empowerment um, so that people have more control and direction um, over their communities and well-being. And I think that, that's a crucial one. And, and ultimately, again, in a rural context, is that we will see more diversity of services that reflect uh, the specific nature and geography and specific issues in each corner of Argyll and Butte. So uh, um, not, a, not a complex list at all. <laughs> Thank you, Techie. Hey, Frank? It's not an easy question for somebody coming from the outside in to answer, but I think there's a couple of things that would say. One is that I think the challenge for everybody on this call is living with uncertainty. That is essentially where we're at at the moment, actually. And I think uh, even thinking about um, the National Care Service, <laughs> sorry, another one of my, my other jobs, but with the National Care Service, there's fairly recently a a report by Celsius on children's services. And one of the things they noticed was that structures made no difference whatsoever to the outcome for children. Uh, if we get stuck in structures and what we call what it is that we do, then we're going to lose the opportunity for that change to happen. So my, my hope for the future is that the relationships that are building now continue to build into the future. And they become the reason why we do things in Argyll and Butte. And not just in Argyll and Butte, but other places, not structures. So health and social care, bring them together, slam them together like what has been done over the last 10 years or so. It's only the relationships that make that work. It's not the structures, it's not what we call it. It's whether we call it a CHP or HACP or whatever, it's the relationships that make the difference. And that's a crucial thing around co-production. And I'm really heartened by the conversations that we've had here today. I don't think it's been very easy to get to this stage. Uh, I think a lot of hard work has gone into it. And people have been uncomfortable with the uncertainty. Embrace it. It's the only place you can be in. You're trying to find out with the blindfold whether or not what it is you've got in front of you. And it's an elephant and nobody knows that. And nobody will know that until we get to the end. And, and the, the, the thing I have to tell you is there is no end. It continues forever. It should happen for the next generation and the next generation. We're investing today for the future. Thank you, Frank. Nikki? I think if we can carry on uh, like the last couple of years have been and, and keep going with this momentum um, and, and the trust within each other, then we're going to end up in a very good place. But the most important thing for me and what I want to see is that we keep having that conversation with local communities, with end users, with the patients, with their loved ones, and more importantly, ensure that we're we're hearing from those seldom heard voices, not the people who would classically pitch up for a, a feedback forum. We need to make sure we're representing everyone within the communities. So let's keep that conversation going with the end users. Thanks, Nikki. That's great. Can I just, um, before we um, come to the question and answer session that Christine will be chairing, um, can I just really briefly say thank you very much to all the panel members who've taken part in this today and thank you for everyone who's um, attended the webinar. Just before I hand over to Christine, um, can I just ask um, Linda to put up the poll um, that we put it up at the beginning? and ask everyone um, if they can, how confident are you that you know what co-production is? Thank you. Shall I come back in, Ali, as people are just completing that? That would be great. Uh, Thanks, um, Christine. Just to echo what Ali said, great big thanks to our speakers today, um, beautiful presentations. The themes that are coming through are around the visuals that people particularly like, um, relationships, avoiding duplication and open to change and challenge. So those are the key themes of comments in the chat box. We've not had many questions and I hope that's not because we've been brutally honest about the time today but thanks for sticking with us as we do this little bit of a test to change of a panel discussion as I, I, I think it worked beautifully um, and we'll look back on it and just um, 
when I come to the closing remarks, just to to say to the people that couldn't join at the start, my apologies for the technical challenges we had with the link. We'll we'll do a little bit of a look back exercise um, after this session um, to see what what happened there. But we do have a few questions um, in the chat box. Um, I'll try and direct them at the most appropriate person that I think could answer them. But please interject if someone else would be better placed to take them. A question from Mary Wright. Um, Mary was saying, can we afford to take the time when statutory services, oblique third sector, are cash strapped and we have to meet targets? So that's about, can we take the time when there's strapped cash services? Taki, I'm, I'm looking at yourself. Do you want to come into that? That's a superb question. I would argue in times of resource constraint, doing this exercise is even more important. It can help reduce conflict and making sure you get the right solution the first time round. It's an absolutely essential practice. And I, I, I think we, we need more parts uh, of the system, not, not just public health and the HSCP, uh, to appreciate the benefits of embracing the challenge of hearing divergent voices. It's not always a threat. Um, I'll end it there. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Taki. Mari, I hope that answers your question. Alison, do you want to come in to add yeah, to that? Yeah, not to be the messenger of doom, but I suppose if we think about where we are now in terms of unmet needs for services, ill health in our population and reducing budgets, there's not any indication that that's going to be better in the short to medium term future. So it's almost flipping that around and saying, actually, we can't afford not to do this. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Another question was from Tanya Rhodes, which was about what steps do you take to ensure that a diversity of voices are heard at a local level when you're working across a, such a wide geographical area? Ali, I don't know if that was one for yourself or maybe Linda maybe would want to come in or anyone. Can I come in, uh, Christine? Absolutely, Frank, come in. It's one of the, the challenge of co-production. It's what the constraints are around what co-production is. And we've just heard one. One is the money that's available. Um, and, but that makes the relationships all the more important. Um, I think in terms of the voices that you get to hear, <clears throat> there are a couple of things that you have to keep in mind, which is you will never be able to engage the entire population. Um, you can try, um, but you nobody here has got the resources in order to do that. Um, so there's an element of representativeness that may well need to be in this process, but that's that's only a problem if it's only going to be happening between now and the end of the year. We're not talking about that. I mean, as I've said earlier on, this is a generational change, generational shift that we're talking about here. And that means you can spend time ensuring that those voices are, are heard. And the last thing I would say is that the, the key voices that make representations on behalf of populations are third sector organisations. So the, the, the TSI and other organisations of similar nature are really important in all of this when you don't have the resources to speak to everybody within a community. Thank you, Frank. Linda. Just going to briefly add in that um, in the uh, programme that we've had really that, that came out around physical activity post the first lockdown, we've just had a very inclusive you know, really, you know, lots of people with interests and different people from different backgrounds have come on to our um, board, and and that's that's really what's what's helped us get to where we are. And now we're at a point where we have um, reviewed that program structure, if you like, and we have got the strategic level board, and then we've got working subgroups in the in the areas that were that we're working. But I think we've we've been quite inclusive to get to that point, which has been helpful. I think. Thank you, Linda. Mahalia. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think um, in our rural um, populations, engagement fatigue is a real thing as well. And so that it's very difficult to keep coming back to the same people and asking the same questions. And that's something that has we've been talking about quite a lot within our groups. And certainly for the Living Well programme, the wellbeing programme we're in the process of developing, the idea is that the co-production is going to happen on the job. You know, it's kind of when we've got the staff in the localities, it's going to be working with the localities to work out what they need as we're doing it. So it's in real time. Um, so I think and whether that that's going to be the answer, I don't know. But that's that's the current plan and we'll see if it works and 
in the spirit of co-production and partnership. If it doesn't, we will try something else. That's great. Thank you, Mahalia. We've maybe got time for one more question. Um, and it's from Anna Wimbley. Um, co-production, collaboration, multi-agency framework and practice models, strategic public social partnerships, how are they the same and different and what's the best fit in different settings? There was a lot there, shall I go again? Um, co-production, collaboration, multi-agency framework and practice models, strategic public social partnerships, how are they the same different and what's the best fit in different settings? Frank. I would just come back to the, my earlier point. Look, look confused by structures. They do get in the way. Ultimately, we're really talking about good relationships. And if that framework works for you and gives you a good relationship, then great. Um, if it doesn't work, it's one side. It's actually, are you, are you able to have, I, I choose my words carefully, an adult conversation with people that you disagree with, because that's ultimately what we're, we have around this table. Not everybody had the same view before they came round to this particular project. We have developed, I say we, this group has developed those relationships over time. That's a crucial thing. The structures are a distraction. Unfortunately, they're a distraction that a lot of people in this call are measured upon. I would fight against all of that. I'm, I'm ultimately just a revolutionary. It's not necessary. If we can't have the relationships, forget about the structures, they make no difference. Thank you, Frank. Linda, do you want to come in? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. And I think coming as coming into this as a as a, a representative of a HSCP, it, it it has we have discussed this in quite a lot of detail in that really we we um didn't want to own you know own the programme, if you like. Um, and we wanted it to be a multi-agency programme, but we do, you know, you need someone in the background that almost will set set that up and do, you know, do the administration, maybe find some funding. But I think um, we could talk about this probably for another hour, is there are very high expectations potentially on HSCPs or, or health boards and councils um, to provide all levels of preventative services. And I think it's really useful to have some honest conversations about, as Alison really suggested earlier, is is that we are designed and funded to deliver services to people that aren't, that, that perhaps are well or are becoming unwell. And, and I think it's really useful to have those conversations within that multi-agency setting, but within communities around the expectations of the statutory organisations and what, what actually is possible and what could we do together, what is clearly what you know, the work, the levels of work that we should fund. I think it's really useful to think about those structures and that's what we've done with, with our programme that I think has been helpful. That's great. Thank you very much, Linda, for that. And, and Frank again. Um, we've kind of reached the end of this webinar today. Um, I think it's been a, a wonderful discussion. So I just want to thank our speakers once again. We've got a couple of questions in the chat box that we haven't got round to. One is posed at Healthcare Improvement Scotland around what guidance and what help and what toolkits do you have for co-production that might be helpful for people embarking on the co-production journey. So we'll, we will answer that one and I'm sure you've posed food for thought for us. And Andrea, we have a question from yourself as well about unleashing the potential of co-production. So we'll get back to you on that and we'll do a look back in the chat box to see if there's anything else that needs answering and, and get back to everybody. So finally, just to say thank you to everybody that's joined us today. Thanks for the panel members that have um, put up the hassling of you on the time. Um, it's been a good journey to have been on with you. We'll share the recording on our website and as we conclude, some questions will appear on your screen and we do really welcome the feedback that help uh, future webinars. So please, if, before you click off, maybe you could just take a few minutes to click on those and, and give us some feedback and we'll take the learning from them. Um, I mentioned at the start that we have recordings of this webinar and previous webinars on our website, so please visit them um, and have a look at them. It's www.hisengage.scot/events. 
Um, so thank you everybody for joining us today and it's good to see some new people joining these webinars and some well kent faces as well. So thank you very much for your support and hope to see you again soon at a future webinar. And finally, thank you, Ali, for um, paying tribute to um, um, the discussion panel and doing a bit of a Jonathan Dimbleby there. You did an excellent job. They should be, Michael Parkinson would be proud of you in, in that role. So thank you again, Ali, um, for, for taking on that role and doing it so eloquently in the way that you did. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day and your week. Bye just now.